The Olympics, a sacred and ancient event where all the nations of the world put forward their greatest athletes and champions to compete against each other in feats of skill and physical prowess, so we can find out which country produces the greatest people. A very noble and dignified affair. However, as anyone who works in event management will tell you, sometimes things can go wrong. And sometimes, everything can go wrong. But when that happens to such an important event like the Olympics, well, then, then it's just really funny. The 1904 Olympic Marathon. The Olympics where everything went wrong. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. But before we get started, we have a new sponsor. A great game, an excellent game, an absolutely smashing game. King of Avalon. A brand new King of Avalon is here. Frost and Flame King of Avalon is a medieval fantasy and strategy game for mobile inspired by King Arthur's story and stars Orlando Bloom as your companion. It's free to play and available in both App Store and Google Play. I recently downloaded the game and I was pleasantly surprised to get bonuses right away in honour of the 6th anniversary. I love the battles because there is an opportunity to be rewarded with new weapons and have a swatch at my favourite favourite character. Just look at him. He is absolutely ballin'. Your hometown has been destroyed by the Unmelted, a creature that attacks anything warm-blooded. With a dragon egg as your last hope and as the new lord, you must gather allies, raise your dragon and defend against your enemies. Also, the Hollywood star Orlando Bloom has joined to help you. It is time to rebuild your dragon empire. I've been having a great time playing King of Babylon, and you should too. I will see you in the game. Build your city and gradually dispel the fog while also building up resources to repair any damage. Manage your territory by governing and accomplishing different missions by rescuing residents. Raise and upgrade your dragon, develop heroes and train troops to increase your power. So download King of Avalon now using the link down below or scan the QR code on the screen and you can redeem a limited in-game pack and have a chance to win an Amazon gift card. New sponsor. Show them some love. Click the link. Just over a century ago, the first modern style Olympic Games was to be held in St. Louis in Missouri and the Olympics were to be joined together with the 100th anniversary celebrations of the Louisiana Purchase, which is when Louisiana was purchased from France for around $15 million. Bargain. People from all over the world were due to arrive for this monumental event, but this was 1904. Charles Lindbergh hadn't yet made his transatlantic flight. In fact, the Wright brothers were still dicking around with their little glider. So, travelling to St. Louis from Europe, Africa and Asia meant a very long and very expensive journey by boat. And even after landing in America, they still had a 1,000 mile train journey to go through. 11 countries in total sent athletes to the games, but Americans made up the majority of competitors because most people from other continents just didn't want to go. The International Olympic Committee founder Pierre de Coubertin thought that the journey was absolutely fucking ridiculous and he did not want to do it. So, in typical French fashion, he put his nose up in the air and refused to go and stayed home in Paris. So, the International Olympic Committee, the committee that literally oversees and manages the Olympics, were refusing to go to the Olympics. The event has only just been 
announced and already it's faced its first fuck up and a, a pretty major one. But obviously the then President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, would be in attendance of such an important event. No, he, he didn't want to go either. Even even the president didn't want to go to the American Olympics. He did, however, agree that he would be the honorary president of the Games, which was his way of saying, I, I don't want to fucking go, but I'll, I'll be there in spirit. A lot of the attending athletes were sponsored by athletic clubs or colleges, so they had the funding and support to actually make the journey. But... Some athletes had to pay their own way to the Games. It was extremely complicated to arrange and finance such a long trip, and those complications actually kept a lot of great athletes from going. So, even though they qualified to be in the Olympics, they couldn't afford the journey. So, before the event even started, a lot of the best athletes who were supposed to be there couldn't even go. But one athlete who was absolutely determined to go was a 5 foot 3 Cuban postman named Felix Carvajal who was a long distance runner from Havana and he didn't allow the complications or expenses of the journey to stop him from going. He was able to skip the long ocean voyage since he was just in Cuba but he still lacked the money to travel inland to St. Louis. Carvajal had barely any experience in actual track events, but he loved to run. And he did have some experience because he ran as a courier during the Cuban War of Independence. He would run up to 30 miles every single day, running to each town to deliver messages. He entered the marathon in order to bring honour to his homeland, even though... Cuba actually hadn't even invited him to join the national team. So, without anyone to sponsor him, Carvajal had to raise the travel money somehow. So, he decided to go and visit the mayor to ask him if he would sponsor him to run for Cuba. But, upon meeting the mayor and asking him, the mayor laughed in Carvajal's face. Mostly because of Carvajal's stature, because, let's, let's face it, he was a... He was a manlet, and also because of Carvajal's poor background, because Carvajal looked homeless, pretty much. But Carvajal was not going to give up easy, so he started running around the Plaza de Arma town square right outside of the mayor's building, and with each lap, he passed by the mayor's window over and over again, staring at him inside <laughs> every time he went past. He ran for the entire day, long enough for people to take notice, and crowds started to form so they could watch him. The mayor couldn't ignore the large crowd anymore, so he begrudgingly wrote a letter of recommendation to help get Carvajal into the race. The mayor went outside and stopped Carvajal from running, and he said to him, Here is an order for your transportation to St. Louis and return." Now go and do your best. Basically saying, all right, all right, all right, you, you annoying fuck. Here's what you wanted, now fuck off. So Carvajal had now won his golden ticket by essentially annoying the absolute fuck out of the mayor until he gave in. The spectators in the square had also given Carvajal some money since they assumed he was some type of weird street performer. So, he had his travel order and he had raised enough money with a little extra left over to make the trip. However, upon arriving by boat in New Orleans, Carvajal immediately lost all of the money in a game of dice. So, so literally, the instant he arrived in America, he gambled away all of the money. So, he now had no funds to get to St. Louis. As you can probably tell by now, Carvajal was not a quitter. So, instead of complaining about his losses, he made the rest of the journey by walking, stowing away on trains, and hitchhiking. When he finally arrived in St. Louis, he was absolutely exhausted and hungry, but he had no money for food. 
So he turned on his charisma and became friends with the weight throwers on the American team who eventually shared their food and lodgings with him. But they also provided him some advice on what he should do for the marathon. Unfortunately, Carvajal seems to have not heeded this advice. Carvajal arrived at the starting line wearing a long sleeve white shirt heavy leather street shoes, long dark trousers, and a beret. To a marathon. He wore, he wore that to a marathon. However, just before the race, one of the American discus throwers, a man named Martin Sheridan, saw that Carvajal's clothing was most likely going to make him collapse from heat exhaustion. So, he cut off Carvajal's trousers at the knee to turn his trousers into shorts. Not ideal, but at least there was now a lot less chance of him collapsing from overheating. Around 680 athletes showed up for all different types of Olympic events. 525 of those athletes were Americans. They would participate in 94 different events, with only one event being for women. Now, remember, this was 1904. Women cooked, cleaned, and looked after children. They did not do sports. But nowadays there are all kinds of women's sports. There are even some women's sports for men. But anyway, some of the non-Americans who participated in the games were Cuban, South African, and Greek. Because, of course, the Greeks turned up, you know, the Olympics is kind of their thing. But the precise figures on participants and the events vary among sources because the official records of this particular Olympics were all lost in a fire. The official games were held on the 29th of August through to the 3rd of September 1904. Though numerous sideshow Olympic events were held from May through to November as part of the Louisiana Purchase Fair. And even though they were the hosts, Americans didn't seem to have much respect for the Olympic Games, which received very mixed reviews. And on top of that, the whole thing was overshadowed by the 1904 World's Fair. Francis Field and Gymnasium was a 12,000-seat stadium which eventually was extended to become the university campus for the Olympic track and field events. Francis Field is where the start and finish lines were for the particular event of this Olympics that we really want to talk about. The Marathon. The almost 25-mile marathon was to begin at 2.30pm on the 30th of August, which was a really bad time of the year to arrange a running event, considering that in St. Louis, summers are extremely warm and humid, especially for a lot of the non-Americans who just were not used to that kind of weather. The temperature was 32 degrees Celsius, or nearly 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The humidity was just as horrible, and the heat index was higher than ever. Only 14 of the 32 starting runners actually completed the course, which was dusty, hilly, and mostly unpaved, and it also included seven steep hills ranging between 100 and 300 feet high. Some of the runners were expert marathoners who had already won or placed in the Boston Marathon and other major races. But if the heat alone couldn't make them drop from exhaustion and heat stroke, then the dust, uneven ground and steep hills of the St. Louis course would. A lot of the runners and trainers even said that the St. Louis course was the hardest run that a human being could handle. Some of the people at the starting line had no idea how amateur they really were to be running in such a race. There were 10 Greeks who had never run in an event in their lives, and two men from the South African Tiswana tribe who were running barefoot. After the starting pistol fired and the runners ran five laps around Francis Field, they began their off-track journey. 
Once they were on the rough roads, they had to dodge cyclists and also run directly behind the cars of their trainers, officials and reporters. Cars that were spitting out exhaust fumes and kicking up clouds of dust right into the faces of the runners. And bear in mind, these were cars from 1904. Their emissions were a hundred times worse than today's vehicles. They were pumping out massive clouds of smog behind them that the runners were just taking straight into their lungs. And another funny little thing about the marathon uh, involving vehicles was part of the marathon course went through the centre of town, where the runners had to dodge traffic because they didn't close the roads. <laughs> they, they didn't close the roads. No one ever thought to say, maybe we should close the roads because running a marathon through traffic sounds a little bit dangerous. But the organisers just thought, nah, it'll be fine. Well, well it was not fine. It, it was not fine. It was so bad that at one point, two Olympic officials had to swerve their car to avoid hitting one of the runners, and both of them ended up crashing into a ditch where they sustained serious injuries. Many of the people at the event said that the cars caused most of the trouble on the course, yet there was another obstacle on the course. The large cracks and potholes on some of the roadways. A problem that, even over a hundred years later, we are still struggling to deal with. Why do I pay tax? Runners had to be careful because if they lost their footing, they could have tripped and sustained all kinds of injuries. And of course, none of them wanted to be disqualified. However, even if they avoided the cracks, there were sharp and jagged stones and in the inches of thick dust laying on the road, which would very often cut into the runner's feet. Now, something that should be a complete no-brainer. You are running a marathon in the St. Louis summer, so the number one thing that should be provided, obviously, is water. And, of course, the event organisers made sure that the runners were given plenty of water. Just kidding. No, they fucking didn't. The only water source for the runners was an old well located 12 miles into the race. Although some of the trainers running alongside the race provided their own runners with water and other necessities along the way... Everyone else who didn't have a trainer, their only source of water throughout the whole race was this single well. And it turned out that the water in the well was stagnant and it made all of the runners sick. But despite all of this turning into a complete shit show, I mean, literally, the water in that well was really bad, someone managed to finally cross the finish line. A man named Fred Laws, who was a bricklayer from New York, and because he worked all day, he could only train for the race at night. He had won a spot on the Olympic marathon by winning a local race. So, congratulations, Fred, on coming first place. Well done. Nope. Psych. Bamboozled. It turns out that Fred actually got a lift in a car. <laughs> Fred. Fred had actually got a lift in a car for 11 miles of the marathon. He started the run just like everyone else, but he started to get tired and he began suffering with cramps. So he got into one of the support vehicles and he just let it drive him for the rest of the marathon. However, the vehicle broke down, so he got out and he continued to run to the finish line, acting as if he hadn't cheated at all and he was even showboating as he went through the ribbon. Luckily, things didn't work out the way he wanted though, because as the first place medal and wreath were being placed around his neck by the president's daughter, Alice Roosevelt, a spectator that witnessed Fred cheating called him out in front of the whole crowd. The spectator shouted to everyone that Fred was a cheat and he told them all that he witnessed him getting a lift in a car. Fred tried to play his little stunt off as a joke, saying that, oh, he was gonna, he was gonna tell the crowd eventually, you know, don't, don't worry guys, it was just, just a prank, bro. It was just, it was just a social experiment, bro, but 
the crowd were a bit smarter than that, and they all started booing him. Fred was disqualified, and he left a disgraced athlete. Though, since he had cheated, first place was still up for grabs. The race was still on. Another runner was a man named Thomas Hicks, who was an English-American brass worker from Cambridge, and towards the end of the race, he, like all of the other runners, was severely exhausted, dehydrated, and he even started hallucinating. He actually hallucinated that he still had another 20 miles to run. He kept begging his handlers for water, but since they had already passed the only water stop in the entire race, they kept telling him they had none to give him. All they gave him was a sponge soaked in warm water to put in his mouth. Eventually, they did offer him something to drink. Raw eggs. They... They... They gave him raw eggs to drink since it was all they had. I mean, it's it's kind of a liquid. But these raw eggs contained a little secret ingredient. A secret ingredient that the trainers had added. Strychnine. Yes, strychnine. The stuff they put in fucking rat poison. Only a small dose was required to be fatal, but... An even smaller dose was, you know, still dangerous, but it worked pretty well as a performance enhancer. This helped Thomas to push on, but his trainers kept feeding him more and more of the shit every time he started to slow down. And they were letting him wash the strychnine down with brandy. As for how the hell could he get away with that, well, this was 1904. There were no laws at all against using performance enhancement drugs for these type of events. Just before Thomas got to the finish line, he needed help from his handlers who actually had to physically carry him over the line. According to them, as they picked him up, his legs were still moving as if he was still running. One of the race officials, a man named Charles Lucas, commented on Thomas's appearance, saying, and I quote, his eyes were dull, lusterless. The ashen colour of his face and skin had deepened. His arms appeared as weights well tied down. He could scarcely lift his legs, while his knees were almost stiff. You know, sort of a old-timey version of his smile, his optimism. Gone. And, according to the doctor, Thomas had actually lost eight pounds of water weight during the race. But... After he recovered, he gained all of it back. Thomas Hicks became the true first place winner of the race, though he didn't know at the time because after he crossed the finish line, he immediately collapsed from exhaustion. But he recovered after about an hour of rest. His running time in total was 3 hours and 28 minutes, which for a first place marathon winner is fucking abysmal. Then we have our boy, the Cuban postman Felix Carvajal, who ran at a reasonable pace, but he kept stopping to talk to spectators in broken English. And at one point, he eventually got hungry, and he asked some passers-by if he could have some of their peaches. They refused, so Felix just grabbed a handful of the peaches and ran away. A little while later, it seemed he was still hungry, so he decided to stop off at an orchard to eat some of the apples. The problem was, he was so hungry and dehydrated that he hadn't really noticed that the apples he was eating were rotten. So Carvajal ended up with very bad stomach cramps. Since he felt really sick, he stopped at the side of the road and laid down to take a nap. Yes, the man took a nap in the middle of a race and he still came in fourth. He came in fourth fucking place. Even though he took a fucking nap, he still came in fourth place. It's believed that if Carvajal hadn't spent so much time talking and napping, he would actually have came in first. Since Carvajal was actually a good runner, he was in 
pretty good condition when he crossed the finish line. Though, he did have a nap along the way. One of the South African runners, a man named Len Tao, was one of the first black runners in US history, and he had also been a dispatch runner in the Boer War. He was doing just fine in the race until he was chased a mile off the track by a pack of wild dogs. But he managed to lose them and then continue the race. Despite the diversion that the dogs had taken him on, he still managed to come in at ninth place. Another incident, though not a very funny one, involved another runner named William Garcia from California, who was 19 miles into the race when he started to choke up blood before collapsing at the side of the road. He would have actually died if it wasn't for a local couple who were spectating the race from their car, spotting him collapsing. They dragged him into their car and then rushed him to hospital as fast as they could. It was then discovered that Garcia's lungs were full of dust and also the lining of his stomach was damaged as if he had swallowed sandpaper. The diagnosis was an internal hemorrhage caused by breathing in and ingesting all of the dust that was being kicked up by the cars that were driving in front of the runners, which actually almost killed him. Luckily, Garcia made a full recovery after a few days in hospital. But he wasn't the only one affected by the dust. Another runner called John Lorden started actually vomiting after breathing in so much dust. And it was so bad that he just decided, nah, fuck this, and left the race and just went home. Now, returning to the event not having any water. You might be wondering how the event organisers could be so stupid as to forget to provide water to marathon runners in the St. Louis summer. Well, it turns out it wasn't stupidity. The runners were not given any water on purpose. The sporting events organiser and founder of the Amateur Athletic Union, a man named James E. Sullivan, was using the marathon as a scientific experiment on the effects of dehydration. All of the runners were part of a secret scientific experiment and they had no idea. They had inadvertently, apparently, signed up to be this random asshole's guinea pigs. At the time, Sullivan believed that by dehydrating the athletes, it would cause their bodies to perform better. This is based on the fact that Sullivan is a fucking idiot. Just one final little fucked up thing before we wrap up. One of the sideshow events that accompanied the Olympics as part of the Louisiana Purchase Fair was something called Anthropology Days. These events are where certain ethnicities were brought in from all over the world to act as savages in a human zoo. The Savages were a sideshow where First Nation Americans, Mbuti tribesmen and Filipinos would throw mud at each other. Where they would throw mud at each other and then climb a greased pole in a race to be the first to the top. 1904. Overall, the 1904 Olympics, and most of all, the marathon, was just a complete shit show. It was mismanaged, poorly planned, dangerous, and unbeknownst to the runners, a literal fucking scientific experiment. It was just absolutely cursed from the start. The 1904 marathon was actually so badly organised, so full of cheaters, and so life-threatening to the runners that many people actually wanted the marathon event itself banned from all games in the future. Fortunately, that didn't happen. The marathon ended up becoming one of the most major and well-respected events at the Olympics. You know, after the introduction of drug testing, planning proper routes, keeping wild dogs away from the route, and also actually giving the runners fucking water. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!